Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Prayer Nation. I'm your host, Jason Sisko. So glad to have everyone with us. Every single week when we do our broadcast, it is a true honor to be able to connect with you. We have so many amazing people of God in the apostolic movement. There are so many prophetic people, intercessors, tremendous men and women of God who are leading. They're leading congregations. They're leading districts. They're leading regions. They're leading others to Christ. They are leading Bible study groups. They're leading prayer meetings. They're leading in their communities, leading in their jobs. You get the picture. There's a lot of people that God is tapping right now that are rising up, that are walking in that followership of Christ. And as we all follow Jesus behind us, there is a wake of his presence and of his glory, which is calling people to step into that wake, arise to their full height, and become the person that God intended them to be from the foundation of the world. Whether these are people coming out of the world into the church, or whether these are people that are brand new coming into the church, or whether these are aspiring ministers, whether these are people that are already in ministry, there is a need for leadership. There is a need for people to have impartation, fathers and sons, generation to generation, we must connect, and we are. There are apostolic spheres that have been established and are getting more and more defined, and those spheres are connecting with other spheres, and we are doing the unprecedented in this last day. We are working together, and there is more unity and more synergy than we have ever had before. So I'd just like to welcome you, whether you're from North America, whether you're from Central America, South America, whether you're coming to us from uh, Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, whether it's Asia, uh, all that great continent, whether it's uh, China or uh, India, Naga land, we say hello to you for our friends, the Mutus, who are uh, connecting there and uh, relaying our broadcast there even to uh, the remote places of the earth. Great things are happening. And then we hear re reports all across the United States, all across the West, that the, the East is now starting to really uh, show more fruitfulness. We don't get to hear the reports very much until, we get re until people come and talk to us because there's so many access challenge issues. But through the Middle East and through Asia, we are seeing great revival and harvest that's there for those that can connect and understand English. In Jesus' name, the day will come and we will have people praying in every language all over the world. But this is the purpose of Prayer Nation. God has a remnant of people because he said his house would be a house of prayer for all nations. And around the throne of God will be every tongue and every kindred and every family of the earth represented. So I just want to say welcome to you today. Thank you for being the tip of the spear, for being willing to be that first blow to handle the intensity of what is going on in the spirit world, for God to trust you and I in these last days to be here now. If he needed the Apostle Paul, he would have been born in this generation, but he was not. If God would have needed Peter, James, and John, they would have been born in this generation, but they were not. You were born in this generation. I was born in this generation. That is God's vote of confidence for us, for his church, and for his people that are in the earth now, is that we upon whom the ends of the world are come. We read this in the book of Acts. Surely it is even more applicable to us in these last days. We must do as they did and turn the world upside down. So as we open our broadcast today with this welcome. I also want to just encourage everyone today to step back into that alignment or to affirm and greater align yourself with the will of God and the purpose of God. And that also you will connect with the people of God that are around you. 
We all need a Paul in our lives, someone that we submit to, someone that we implicitly trust with spiritual covering and spiritual authority in our lives. Someone that if we get into trouble, they will seek us out or we can seek them out. We all need Barnabases in our lives, people that come alongside of us, encourage us, and help us to take our next steps in ministry, and maybe are a little bit ahead of us until they launch us to go a little bit beyond where they are. But we need contemporaries, people on either side of us, that we are helping them and they are helping us, and we are moving forward together. And then we all need a Timothy in our lives. We need someone in the next generation, someone that's rising up, coming up, that we are help fostering them, that what was imparted to us does not remain with us, that what we have learned and the areas that we are developing in, that even though we are not where we want to be, we have made steps, we have moved forward, and we want to share what we know with those who are hungry, that are coming up uh, and are coming along uh, in their own respective ministries and discipleship. So we have to have someone above us, alongside of us, and someone that we're pulling up beneath us, that we're covering them. It is so important for us to have these powerful relationships in our lives that keep refining the kingdom of God and helping us to advance. This is a part of our three-tiered strategy for global prayer initiatives, and that is visitation, transformation, and multiplication. Today, we're going to address some things on the political uh, landscape and how it relates to the Antichrist system. We will also talk about preparing for Purim as we are just weeks away now, and some specific things that relate to this particular cycle of Purim, how it relates to um, us as an apostolic people and what is coming at the same time of year, it coincides with another uh, specific date on our calendar, and that is Palm Sunday. As well as closing out our broadcast with a piece on measuring maturity. But before we do that, let's begin this broadcast as we always do, by getting into the presence of God and by opening up our spirit to him and being reminded that everything that happens in your body, everything that is visible and physical is a reflection. And when we are redeemed and our minds are transformed, we will see it all through the lens of how God sees it and how God intended it. We will not be disconnected from the divine, but rather we will be able to see the overlapping of visible and invisible, of how the physical material teaches us about that eternal and invisible spiritual realm. And when we pray spirit, soul, and body prayers, this is when that all kind of comes together. The carnal man and the carnal mind brought separation. It is the same goal that we see from the spirit world and the kings of the earth in Psalms chapter two, they want to divide the Lord from his anointed. They want to separate the realms. They want to separate the spirit from the, the visible. They want to say that Jesus was just another man and he does not truly represent the father in flesh. He is something else. And to divide that anointing, separate the anointed one from the Lord. And in the same doing, this is how we see this whole system within the earth is to disconnect us and keep us constantly engaged in our fleshly man. So as we pray today, we will do what Jesus did and restore that symmetry back. He is the last Adam, and this is the dispensation of the fullness of times as all things are gathered together in one in Christ. So as we pray let us pray that oneness into existence. Father, we thank you today that you have anointed us, that you have appointed us, you have assigned us. And now, Lord Jesus, we seek that you will again align us. So, Father, we come to you as your sons and daughters, knowing that the struggle remains. Every day, we must be surrendered. Every day, we must die. Paul said, I die daily. So, Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would help me to embrace the cross. 
however much my flesh does not like it, however much my stubborn will does not want to bow, however much the carnal mind does not want to listen, I pray today that you would cause me, oh God, that you would come into my mind, into, into my thinking, that you would come into my spirit, oh God, today, and that you would help me and help everyone that is joining with me in prayer right now, everyone that is closing their eyes, everyone that is centering their minds and hearts upon you. Today, in the name of Jesus, we get into a position of prayer. I am seated, but others may be kneeling, or they might be standing, or they might be driving. If they're driving, Lord, we want you to protect them as they drive. But Lord Jesus, as we pray together right now, we ask you, Lord Jesus, that we would take a spiritual position in you, a position of complete surrender, of bowing our spirit and bowing our will in the same way that we would bow our knees or prostrate ourselves upon the floor before you. For you are King of kings and Lord of lords, and it is your everlasting gospel that we obey. It is your everlasting life, O oh God, that we want to remain as a gift within us. It is that future with you in eternity that is so much more important than the fruitless things of the world that are just vanity and emptiness in time and space. But Lord, you have given us this dimension of time and space in which change may be made, in which things may be altered, plans may be switched out, generational curses can be turned into generational blessings, dysfunction can be turned into function, brokenness can be turned into health, sickness and chronic illness can be turned into abounding miracles of healing in our lives. Father, I thank you that you gave us grace and mercy. And so by that perfect pattern which you had in your mind when the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world, so we circumvent all of the world system and all satanic accusations. We arise above all of the flesh and the carnal mind and we step into the spirit by faith and we access all that the cross has made available to us in the name of Jesus. And I surrender myself again, and I submit myself to you. And I want you to say it with me, prayer nation, spirit, soul, and body in Jesus' name. All my senses, seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, smelling. Let it all be engaged as I have senses to connect to the material, physical world. So let those senses also be a reflection of the true senses to see in the spirit, to hear, to smell the fragrance, to taste and see that the Lord is good and to feel after you and find you though you be not far from any one of us. Distinguish what we feel after with our spirit from our emotions and let our emotions all be submitted to their proper order to move, O oh God, into the redeemed emotions. Deliver us, O oh God, from all emotions that are in the lower register of flesh and of sin and of fallenness. And cause us, O oh God, to have that expression that comes from your spirit as our spirit is separated from our soul. So let the soul be redeemed and now re reimagined, recaptured, oh God, inside of the imagery and the thought process of the divine design of heaven. In the name of Jesus, that we would have a miracle, oh God, in our eyes, a miracle in our hearing, a miracle in our minds, a miracle in our heart, and miracle in our emotions. In Jesus' name, that we would know, oh God, Christ and that Christ would be in us and that all that Christ is would be formed within us so that we can be the express image of your person even as Christ is the expressed image of your person. For they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And if it was possible for the apostles, it's possible for us. So don't let them see us, but let them see you. Let us be transparent that you will shine through us, Father that they will not see our face or hear our voice or feel our spirit or even know of our emotions, but it will be the, 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 the bowels of mercy, as your word says, compassion, O oh God, that flows out of Christ and your heart. And in the name of Jesus, that there will be an overflow from God consciousness that will supersede our self-consciousness 
and will help us to be crucified to the world and the world crucified to us, that we will not be world conscious anymore. Help us to be in the world, to discern, to understand, to see the trends, the patterns, to see clearly what Satan is trying to do and to know what is the will of God so well that we will continually enforce the will and the mind of God in the earth. Let your kingdom come and let your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. This we declare again in Jesus' name. Let there be one God and let us stand in the center of that one God, the Most High. There is none higher than you. There is none greater than you. And we exalt you, Father, our Father which art in heaven. Hallowed be your name. We pray now that you would bring us to the one emotion of your perfect love. Let us be in that perfect timing of God in the eternal now and in that perfect contentment in the place that you have set us in the infinite here. And let us be, Lord Jesus, right now in that center of that one God and in that one motion of saying, staying in the intersection of these ones that we can truly live out oneness within our lives. God in Christ in us. As you said in John 17, Jesus, that we all be made one in Christ. I thank you, Father, today that we are one individually and we are one corporately with you. And through that, we attain oneness. We attain unity and symphony amongst the brotherhood. So as the cross connects us first to you and then the other bar of that cross reaches side to side. So, Father, I pray that you would bring us into a, 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 an, a symphonia, bring us into a camaraderie, a maximization of gifts, an enlarging of territory through that understanding and maturity that comes in the body of Christ by accelerating others, by celebrating the spiritual authority that is in our lives, by celebrating those who are gifted around us by acknowledging those who are better than us in different things, that we may also find our place within the body and be welcomed into the body, and that we may function, oh God, not worried about others, but just simply doing the will of God and being fruitful and abundantly fruitful in time, and that that fruit will remain. This we pray in Jesus' name. Now let's put on the whole armor of God together. We take our loins good about with truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, which is the rhema word of God. The global church is emerging, and this year we will see vast jumps. This leap year will be a quantum leap year for the people who are prepared, for those who have extra oil, for those who see the open door, and for those that hear the wake-up call. God is awakening his church right now. And in just a few days here at the Church Triumphant, we will have Awakened Ladies Conference. God gave this word to my wife about four years ago and said a movement was coming. And it wasn't awakened, it was awakened with an E-D, that we are being awakened in the spirit. That it's not just a verb, but it is also describing people as a noun that the awakened or that there already is something that has happened and is happening and it's ongoing. So I believe that that was something that was tapping uh, something for the ladies and for a movement that is rising up. But I believe it's also from the larger picture. We have heard about these great awakenings. We've heard about a first and a second awakening and I've even heard about a third awakening that's happened uh, when I was going, growing up in school, I'd only remember studying the first and second, but apparently there was a third awakening, and now people are talking about uh, us entering into a fourth great awakening in the earth. We have to recognize uh, in these political cycles, we have to recognize what God's agenda is for us. And as we study the book of Esther, and as we look at the patterns, we see that they overlap each other. And so this is why it's important for us to know the seven spirits of God, the seven uh, churches of the candlestick, the menorah. And it's also important for us to know the seven levels of relationship, but with all of this in the context of seven dimensions. 
man finds himself naturally in the third dimension. That's where he appears on the stage when he is born and enters into the world. This is the dimension of food and friends and knowledge. This is where we have social life, where we think about our physical being in the material world, and we see separateness in everything. But we also know that beyond the realm of gravity, there are other dimensions. And this is where the fourth dimension, fifth, sixth, and seventh dimensions come in. They all operate independent of gravity. They are not uh, subject to because they are higher than. And Jesus talked to us about laws, competing laws, that the law of the spirit of life makes me free from the law of sin and death. These are things that I talk about often here on Prayer Nation because I want you to see them for what they are, spiritual laws. As certain as gravity, these laws exist. These are not uh, things that we manufacture in our imagination. These are not the frameworks of just thought and ideas. These are not spontaneous um, kind of breakthroughs that God just kind of does randomly. And we just kind of are thankful for what we get when we get it and then go back into the void and the wandering in the wilderness. No, these are principles that God has set in motion in the universe, that God set these laws just as Colossians 1 tells us that he created thrones and mights and dominions. He created everything that was visible and invisible. He did it all, and it was all made for him and by him. And through him, all things hold together and consist. So once we enter the kingdom, we begin to see. That's when we begin to see. And so we have to be able to rise above all of the political schemes, because these political schemes, while they operate in the world systems and they do directly affect our lives and laws that are passed and policies that are made, whether they are uh, national uh, policies or whether they are foreign policies, whether they are local amendments and rules and things that happen alongside of national elections, there's lots of other things that go on in these huge cycles that kind of feed on the large machines of, of right versus left, Democrat, Republicans. And, and I'm talking primarily today about American politics because we're in election cycle. But what happens in America does affect the world. And so as the church, we must not get sucked in to all of the traps that are laid. And so I put today the Trump trap because I believe that it's very easy to get sucked in to the whole energy that is around uh, the divisiveness of politics. And no matter what election cycle it is, it's going to be somebody that's gonna sound mean, somebody that's gonna throw mud, and a lot of times they throw it on each other uh, while they're trying to get the nomination, and then they turn around and then try to throw mud on the candidate they're running against in the main elections. And it all just kind of gets into this um, uh, delicious type of gossip feeling of secrets and, and uh, thriving on the negative and thriving on you got him good or you got her good or they should not be president or, oh, I cannot imagine uh, all of this. And so there's a trap to just get us sucked in to this um, very, very partisan politics as they play to their bases. So we realize, and I talked about Biden in my last uh, broadcast, we realize that he has been weak and he has been He's old, he's the oldest president we've ever had, and he's possibly even sick and being just, uh, from the medicines and the expert care that he has, has just been being kept alive, and yet he still is uh, seemingly wanting to run for another term, and we're trying to figure out how he would even survive that, and we're all shocked that he's made it this far. I mean, that's just the reality of it. And then there's words like Michelle Obama jumping into the game, and people are excited about that. Uh, Kamala does not seem to be a viable option now. But at the same time, we know that the machinery of the Democratic Party has not really even kicked in yet. And um, they are known for their stylistic approach. They have all of the media on their side. They have all of Hollywood on their side. They have all of the cool people on their side because they are preaching a message of 
of embracing of progressive uh, thought process. And so when you even say progressive, we all wanna go forward, don't we? Don't we all wanna make strides? It even sounds nice to say you're a progressive, but what does it really mean progressing in which direction? Uh, for what purpose? And what is inclusion really all about? It is about the eroding of the family. It is about taking away our Judeo-Christian values. It is about uh, being anti-Bible and anti-God and uh, pushing all forms of pornography and perversion and um, just allowing anything to happen that is out there and just being sympathetic towards any neurosis or disease of the soul that makes someone confused or frustrated or deviant and just trying to find it a way to make it normal, just normalizing sin and normalizing dysfunctional behavior, or at least being compassionate towards them if we don't, in our hearts, uh, really like them, at least allow them to do whatever they wanna do and don't get in their way. It's all about this agenda, and they call it something else. And there are a lot of legitimate issues that do need to be addressed that are mixed in to all of that, which help it and give it legitimacy in its cause. Yes, we need to have racial equality and social justice. Yes, we need to have equality of pay with men and women. Yes, it's important that there's not any any uh, gender or race or people in society that are not listened to or their voices are not heard. And that's especially in a democratic uh, system. This is kind of what we are supposed to thrive on. But at the same time, while they're preaching that, they also censor people and cancel people and come after people that speak anything that does not agree with them. While at the same time saying that you're, a, you know, you're uh, full of hate if you preach the, the truth of the word of God, uh, or you're homophobic if you preach what the Bible says about morality and about uh, men and women in marriage, uh, any of those things that you might say, you're immediately pushed back against and told that you're not allowed to speak. And I'm not allowed to say what I believe, but you can say whatever you want to say. And that's really kind of this, this double standard that has always existed. And it's very difficult to overcome. So here comes Trump. And what Trump does is he just comes right in their face and he just throws it right back at them. And so a lot of the silent majority out there really feels something that resonates but then it gets into all this pettiness, and then it gets into um, all of this other that is stylistically not palpable. Or everyone says, we wish your ex, or for formerly called Twitter, Twitter feed would not be so uh, aggressive. Or why are you going to die on that hill? And then there's on the other side where people just blindly defend uh, their candidate, whether it's uh, right or left, because we don't want the other guy or we don't want the other girl. And so there's this trap. And, and I saw this a lot, and I, you've heard me maybe say this before, but as we're coming back into this season where Trump is emerging as the primary candidate, um, am I against Trump? No, of course not. I'm not against Trump. Uh, my goal is not to be against anyone. My goal is to be against what is wrong in the movements behind them. And that we as the church must be able to touch people where they are and understand as they spend millions of dollars to un to um, uh, through focus groups and surveys and all of the phone calls and even the foot soldiers finding out what makes Americans tick or voters uh, be motivated to vote. All of those things we should really learn from as the church of what motivates people and understand that our job, our first and foremost job is to preach the gospel and make disciples. That if the church is really gonna be valid, it is not by just standing behind a candidate or a, a flawed political party. Yes, we can support whatever conservative views we feel. I mean, do whatever you feel you need to do. But if the church is seen as just one thing, if the church is seen as Republican, or if the church is seen as just conservative, or if the church is seen, that's exactly what the devil wants. Does that mean that we come out and do what these liberal denominations are doing and embrace the gays and uh, bring them out to our churches and put gay flags in our churches and all this stuff? No, I think that's ridiculous, but we can see that their, that their plan worked. They're trying to infiltrate the church. They're trying to influence the church, whether it's East, 
or West, whether it's liberal or conservative, there is a movement to to try to diminish the church and to influence the church and take away our true power to change things in the world. It starts for us on our knees. It starts for us in prayer. It starts for us by being able to discern the will and the mind of God. Daniel functioned in in a completely opposite pagan environment. He functioned there with multiple administrations, and yet he was seen as someone that God's spirit worked in, and they could not deny his capacity to interpret and to give direction for the future. It was because of his prayers and fastings that he circumvented, he went beyond the kingdoms of men, and he operated in the kingdom of God. And as such, he was able to actually prophesy to people that were on the highest level. And these were not elected. These were dictatorial, powerful generals who became kings. They, these kings dominated the world. Nebuchadnezzar dominated the entire world. And and yet he is standing before these kings. He stands before Darius, Belteshazzar. He tells them what the hand on the wall is saying. This is what the church must be known for, for, for being able to speak to governments, to be able to speak to nations, and to be able to give direction of what is needed. We must call this nation to repentance. We must call people, whether they are Republicans, independents, or Democrats, to repentance. We must preach Jesus as the Savior. We have seen this uh, amongst various um, sides of it, and while it's easy sometimes when you are not in that camp to see what's wrong in the other side, sometimes it's very difficult for us to see what might be lurking below and beneath in those camps that we believe in or that we support. Just like it's hard for denominations sometimes to look in the mirror. Mirrors work, but people don't always want to look in them. Just like organizations don't always want to see it. Just like churches don't always want to see it. Just like pastors don't always want to see it. Folks, and let's get real. Sometimes you and I don't want to look in that mirror. We have to realize that this is a season of repentance. This is what God is wanting from us. He's wanting us to repent. If my people will, I will, and I'll heal your land. The land is healed if the church is first aligned and right with God and operating in repentance. I cannot preach repentance if I don't repent myself. I cannot preach humility to America if I am not humble myself. I cannot preach surrender to Jesus if I am not living that type of life. And so the church right now must be awakened and not just be sucked in for its influence in the conservative world to bring out the vote. But we must instead see what moves the hearts of men and women. If you want to change laws, it starts first by changing people's lives. And when lives are changed and transformed, it changes what they want it changes who they vote for. It changes what they accept. It changes how they think. But right now, there's a 24-7, 365 stream of drivel that is coming through every type of outlet, from cable to mainstream television to all of the offshoots of YouTube and Facebook and IG and uh, TikTok, all the social media and all of the arts are constantly streaming. There is a, there is a constant air. Satan is the prince and the power of the air. He's creating an atmosphere. He's, he's creating a culture that people are breathing in and folks our young people are tapped into it our college kids are hearing it on their campuses they're constantly getting it and if we are not wise in the spirit if we do not understand what's going on we will be completely irrelevant and won't even understand why and all they will see is that we're here for trump 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 and they'll see us as people supporting someone who is flawed and I'm not saying cannot promote the candidate that you like. Go ahead. It's your, your uh, constitutional right to, to free speech and to tell people what you think. 
But I say as the church, we have to pray about these things. We must be sober about these things. We must see the larger picture of what is happening. We have to see what happens if he gets in and what happens if he doesn't get in. We have to see what happens if we, if we have more of the right and more of the left, because this is the truth, folks. The Antichrist spirit is working on both sides. I'm gonna smile again and I'm gonna say it again. The Antichrist system is working on both sides of politics. It uses the right for its particular side of its agenda and it uses the left on the other side of its agenda. It's what we've been talking about for years. It's, it's clay and it's, and it's iron. They don't mix, but they're a part of the same feet and don't you ever forget it. It's part of the same organization. We use extremes to move the middle. We use shifts of pendulums to continually lull people into either into their apathy or to incite them into anger. It is a constant act and react system. And we have it within the church as well. There's liberal and conservative agendas that we push back one direction or the other. And in so doing, we get off balance. We are not moving forward. We're just moving from side to side. And what God wants us is to advance his kingdom. He wants us to advance his kingdom. So this is where we have to see these competing agendas. We have to understand the spirit of Haman, the hate. This is what is being fostered, is hate. This is why we cannot fall into this tramp of politics, why we cannot be sucked into it, because we will end up on the, on the same emotions that they're purposely trying to incite. And we have to say, okay, Lord, help me to see what your will is and help me to pray your will. And then somehow see through all of this chaos that is purposely being created, what the real agendas are. There is a global agenda, and that is to destroy America. There is a global agenda to destroy the West. What is happening with BRICS is a coalition that is being built. Is this the beast coming out of the sea with seven heads and ten horns? We don't know, but it sure looks a lot like it. And when we see the biblical process, this is where the Haman and Mordecai and preparing for Purim comes in. There is an agenda to destroy the people of God. Just as you see uh, the, the, the angry Hamas uh, uh, rhetoric of destroying Israel that has caused this huge retaliation of the Jews, so now we see in the spirit there is a huge a uh, movement to try to destroy Christianity around the world. We're either gonna destroy it by make it irrelevant, we're gonna destroy it by infiltrating it with, with uh, false doctrine. The Bible says that there would be doctrines of devils that we would have to contend with. There must needs be heresies, Paul said, that it would prove us. We, we know this even from Deuteronomy 13, that there are dreamers of dreams and prophets which teach the wrong thing, but their dream comes to pass, and the Lord is proving us to see whether we truly be obedient. There are things within, in other words, that are antichrist, and the Bible says they went out from us that they might be manifest that they were not of us, for if they were truly of us, they would no doubt have stayed with us. But then he begins to describe them as antichrists. So there are people within the church system that are antichrist. And then there is an antichrist system without that is working. The beasts that are, that, that are rising up, the, the, the system that is joining together, political system. So we as the church must be able to navigate this. The Lord spoke to me coming into this year that there would be a leadership vacuum. And I'm talking about it again because we must pray about these things. What was needed? What was needed when Haman had his full agenda? What was needed was someone to stand in that gap. Mordecai went and sat in the king's gate. Guess what? Guess what? Haman had already made an appointment to destroy Mordecai. He was already coming in to talk to the king and bring his accusations so that he could be put on a gallows before they got to the 13th day of the 12th month. 
So we haven't got to the end of all this yet. We haven't seen the full cum, a culmination of the Antichrist system emerge. But I'm going to tell you, there's other smaller events that Satan is creating that he wants to try to bring through accusations. The destruction of fivefold ministry now. The destruction of those who are the leaders. He wants to destroy leaders now. This is why there had to be an awakening within the church or an awakening of Esther. And Esther had to go before the throne. She had to use her influence. She had to use her skill of speaking and approaching. She had to use the relationship that she had and the love within her heart had to be reignited for her king. And she had to go in before the king. If she doesn't go into the throne, there is only accusations at the throne. The reason why the church le loses or the reason why ministries lose or the reason why ground is lost is because God is looking for an intercessor and he can't find one. It's because he's looking for someone to stand in the gap and make up the hedge, but they're not there. It's because he's looking for leaders, but instead by default, someone else is leading in social media, someone else is leading in politics, someone else is leading in shaping the minds of America or the minds of the West, or the minds of the East. Someone else is there that is preaching. Someone else is a social uh, s social media influencer that is, that, it, that is making a bigger impact. And so the Lord said to me that all of the destabilization that is causing, now Trump is a disruptor, that's his role. So when, when America is destabilized, when the economy is destabilized, when the political system is destabilized, when we are polarized and extreme, we are headed very potentially, into uh, the goal is to bring about martial law. The goal is to bring about some type of a, of a huge conflict where there's people marching in the streets again. Uh, January 6th on steroids. That's the goal. The goal is a civil war again. So we can override the Constitution and override all of the principles there of checks and balances. And with America in that kind of chaos, what happens? What happens in the world? See, America has been raised up for the, for the role that the church plays in the world. America has a spiritual destiny and identity. 80% of the world's missionaries come from America. 80% of the world's Bibles are printed in America. And all of the funding, the majority of the funding comes from this wealthy nation, the richest of all nations, America. And so God is protecting America because of these agendas. And also our relationship with the state of Israel. So all of these things together combined make God work for the protection of, uh, of America and the work of America. If we do not meet our goal, if we do not meet our agenda, if we do not be the people of God that America was supposed to be to spread the gospel around the world, then America's need for existence will cease and we will lose our place. And the church will go into persecution. And because we did not do it when we had peace and prosperity, we will have to do it because we are running and we are hiding. Just as it happened in Jerusalem, persecution scattered them to the four winds and they preached the gospel everywhere. So the gospel will be preached in all the world and then shall the end come. But folks, if we want to see some changes in the world, we have to be motivated now. And the Lord said to me, not only must there be leaders that rise up in the church, he said, I need more prophets in the international stage. I need more apostles on the international, in, on the international stage. We need people that are being able to see prophetically, understand what's going on on the international stage, that can discern and know the mind and the will of God. These are the unstoppable voices. These are the unstoppable intercessors. These are they which shake the world. And God wants us to move beyond, not just move back to where the apostles were, but to move beyond where the apostles were in these last days. That's what God is desiring, that there would be that global candlestick again of seven churches and seven spirits and seven angels. This is what God is wanting in these last days, that there would be a, cl a true picture of the real church, and that comes through a powerful movement on the international stage, and then the national stages of our respective nations, and then 
in our states or regions or provinces and then in our cities and then within our communities. But the Lord said, I do not want it to stop with fivefold ministry. He said, I want it to be that every saint of God is hearing my voice and is flowing in the spirit that these signs will follow them that believe. I see this visitation as a mobilization of people who have been standing around idle and simply did not have the clarity, did not have the focus, did not have the go ahead, were not released. This year is a year of activation. You are feeling it. All of my intercessors out there, prayer nation, you are feeling it. All the pastors out there, you're feeling a restlessness. All of the evangelists, you're feeling a sense of urgency. All of the prophets, they are seeing the same picture in different ways, with different words. They're coming together with visions and dreams of God accelerating the kingdom of God. And the apostles know now that we must take new territory, and so we will. In this first quarter leading up to Easter, we are moving into this pattern of Purim. Purim was prepared for that Mordecai, after they prevailed at the throne, Mordecai began to set in motion laws on an international state that would empower the people of God all around the world. These were the same ones that were in sackcloth and ashes. And now these have seen new laws that are being passed, a law on top of a law. This is a pattern on top of a pattern. This is the will of God on top of the will of the Antichrist system or the Haman spirit. This is the mind of God superseding all of the minds and the strategies of these who have joined themselves together. Kings of the, of the earth set themselves and rulers take counsel. But the Bible says, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they have known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That same hidden wisdom is still in operation right now. And we as the church, according to Daniel 11, the wise, we must understand we must have that wisdom. We must tap it. The end time church more than ever must tap it. And these things that have been sealed up must be unlocked and revealed. And we must operate in these patterns and plans rather than playing into the patterns and plans that Satan has through all of these political agendas and all these global financial market crashes and all of the fear mongering that goes on in the media and all the wars and rumors of wars. Jesus told us not to be troubled. In, Mark, in, in Matthew 24. So we must instead pass laws. We must make decrees. It is time for the apostles to make decrees. It is time for the prophets to see the patterns and declare them. It is time for the evangelists to take the decrees to the four winds, to the four corners of the earth. It is time for every pastor to, to bring in these these insights, revelations, and establish this authority locally that God is setting on the global stage and cause our local churches to be revived and energized and aligned so that we may grow with massive evangelism because the Bible says as the decrees were passed and as the words were sent throughout all of the languages of the world, hastened by the king's decree, Mordecai stamped it with the king's ring in the name of Jesus. In every province, the Bible says princes helped the provinces. And the Bible says many people became Jews for fear of the Jews. Something shifted in the earth, a momentum and a boldness came upon the people of God until that day of reckoning came, the 13th day of the 12th month. That's Purim. So we have something that we have been hearing from God through prophet Bobby Wade talking about one day where all ministers around the world will surrender themselves and repent before God. And it would be a combination of Joel 2 and Mordecai's uh, instruction to Esther to fast and pray. And this brought about a great victory on Purim. And so we are going to bring this together on Purim. We are going to talk about this more and bring out more. World Network of Prayer is working together with this agenda, and we're gonna be sending out videos more about this. You'll see short little uh, snippets of various prayer team members that are going to be coming forth and 
our general superintendent is going to also, Brother David K. Bernard in the United Pentecostal Church is going to be giving some directions on this as well. But it's time for us to align ourselves. It's time for us to come into a spirit of repentance because it also cor uh, correlates this year and connects to uh, the same day of Purim is also Palm Sunday. So in the Jewish calendar, it's sundown Saturday to sundown uh, Sunday. And then, of course, that Sunday is when we celebrate our Gregorian calendar uh, when the Lord of the Temple arrives. We call it the triumphal entry. But it was also the day that Jesus cleaned out the temple. So it's time for us to bring about a shift where we are fasting and praying and turning the enemy on its head. And through a global thrust of ministers, men and women of God leading the way, the global church will join with us in fasting and prayer. And on one day of reckoning this year at Purim, we will see the kingdom of God come with power. The Lord of the temple will arrive. The celebration will come and the city, the cities of the earth will shake saying, who is this? And we will declare it's Jesus. It is the son of David. And we will see that son of David come. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and he shall arise and he shall sit in his temple as the Lord of that temple. And he will cast out all of the religious systems, the money changers and the seats of them that sell doves. And he will again restore it to a house of prayer and the blind and the lame will come. Coming out of Purim and coming into Passover week and in Easter week, we believe that this will be the beginning of the glory of God sweeping into the earth. Let us see a movement of God that is greater than any political movement. Let us see intercessors. Let us see evangelism. Let us see an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that's greater than any political party, greater than any government, greater than any other uh, uh, determination that has been made through any global entity in the earth or any satanic system or those who sit on the heights of these mountains that make decisions or these pyramids of power. Let it be greater than all of them. For that stone that comes out from the mountain that Daniel talked about, that stone made without hands will smash the image. And as the Bible says, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. Let's lift our hands together and let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you today that your kingdom will come. We are praying, oh God, a momentum a momentum that will be built this year as, as we would go to a fire hydrant and open the fire hydrant, that it would, it would be the full force of the water and not just a hose that squelches it or controls it, but that the control of the flow will be removed, that you will lift off, oh God, all of the restraints. This was the work that you were doing in us in 2023. So that in 2024, I declare it and I decree an unprecedented move of the Holy Spirit. I declare the glory of God will sweep, the clouds will come, and they will hover the obedient. They will overshadow those who are hungry. They will overshadow those who have the revelation, these who are the wise, who have prepared themselves. Uncork again, we ask, or unleash, O oh God, again, the end time oil that has been sealed up, the promises waiting for this hour. O oh God, we pray in the name of Jesus, let there be a church that will emerge with more influence influence and power, that the nations of the earth will know who the Jesus name people are. Oh God, I pray in Jesus name for an unstoppable force of evangelism and disciple making. You told us to disciple the nations, go into all nations and make disciples. So Father, we pray in the name of Jesus for movements, oh God, that are so great that we can again see what Hebrews 11 said, that they turn to flight the armies of the aliens. Oh God, I thank you, Father, that we can over 
overthrow kingdoms or subdue kingdoms. These are the kingdoms of darkness, oh God, that have been leeches, oh God, upon the, the nations of men. And we pray in the name of Jesus that the nations will turn, for the desire of nations is coming. Lord Jesus, and as your word says in Haggai, you do, will not just shake the earth only, but also heaven. Father, we thank you that all that can be shaken will be shaken, that only that which cannot be shaken will remain, for our God is a consuming fire. And so we pray it in the name of Jesus that we would supersede politics, and yet you would help us to see how we are supposed to pray. Help us to know how to pray about, about politics in the United States. For, Lord Jesus, we have a spiritual destiny more than being a superpower, oh God, to be the policeman of the world. Raise us up, oh God, to be a superpower of evangelism, a superpower, oh God, of missionary work, a superpower, oh God, of establishing your name in every nation around the world, that people will see the blessing of God, and they will know it's because in God we trust is embossed upon our coins. Father, I pray for a restoration of hope, for a renewal, oh God, of strength, for a healing of the corruption, O oh God, that has eaten away at the heart of our major cities. O oh Lord Jesus, for those that are oppressed, for those that are underserved, for those, Lord Jesus, O oh God, that are overlooked, we are praying in the name of Jesus. We ask you, God, for minorities. We pray, O oh God, for the disadvantaged, for those, O oh God, that have been oppressed that those have not been uh, educated well. We ask you, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that revelation will come, that strength will come, that the churches will be able to serve those communities in ways, oh God, that even government programs cannot. We pray in the name of Jesus for city transformations. We are praying, oh God, that you would help us to reach our communities, to be seen as givers, oh God, to be seen as those who can facilitate the change, that drug addicts are being delivered. Oh God, people that are stuck and hurt and hang ups. Oh God, can find answers and hope within the borders of our churches. Oh God, that the gospel will transform their hearts and get them out of their addictions. But I am praying also that you would help us to reach those, oh God, who are searching and are looking, who have, who have found hope in times past, oh God, amongst uh, political movements, but are disillusioned now. Help them to find hope in the kingdom of God. I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus that you would help every one of our mayors, our congressmen, our senators, oh God, those who represented us in our provinces around the world, those who represented us in our parliaments, oh God, those who are representing our governments, oh God, we pray in the name of Jesus for all who are in authority, that you would grant us favor, that there would be men like Paul that would rise to those top places of, of, of standing before kings and all who are in authority, that you would raise up, Lord Jesus, in these last days, Daniels and Josephs and Esthers. God, we pray, oh God, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, let the church fill their place. Let them stand in their rightful operation of authority. Let us sit with you in heavenly places, knowing, oh God, that we are the head and not the tail. God, I pray in Jesus' name that we would lead and that we would influence and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. We are seeing a growing AI system. And even in our uh, Hollywood movies, more and more AI is being talked about. It's, uh, and these are little hints. Some of it is uh, imagination and some of it is creative license. But there's a lot of truth that's underneath the surface that is conditioning us towards a goal. AI is real. It is real. There is AI in business. There's AI in Amazon. Gets your package to your door uh, today sometimes even. Uh, it's, it's what Walmart's using. It's, it's AWS that is even giving you all the statistics in the NFL games for all of the fantasy football people out there. And they're using it for their businesses around the world. Billion dollar businesses are using AI. In that regard, it's something that's designed to help mankind. But then there is an AI that is getting stronger and stronger in the military complex. It's getting higher and higher, even in writing speeches and helping people uh, in academia and in politics to make uh, critical analysis. This AI is getting stronger and stronger in so much that 
it is so much farther ahead of the human ability to process that before long we may have a genuine threat to human existence where it will not serve us but we will serve it i believe that when we read the scriptures about how that there will be a beast that will create an image and the image will be worshiped you read this in 13th chapter of revelation and anyone who doesn't worship the beast will be killed the bible says and they must have the name of the of the beast or the mark of the beast that's written upon them they will not be able to buy or sell the mark of the beast all of this growing up the bible says he will give life to the beast itself to an image so the beast will be something that is living or a system that is living and a person that is living but there'll also be an image that that will be given power and it will be able to speak it will be able to speak what are you talking about what is that what is that image what is the power of that image and what is its ability to speak could it be this this uh, artificial intelligence so what is the answer to all of this what is the answer to ai they're really trying to imitate god it is that make the processor so fast make the computers have so many of the algorithms teach them how to self learn it is really it is really satan trying to create a system that acts like God, that is omniscient, omnipotent, and um, omnipresent. That's his goal. But I want to remind you that God himself will never be outdone. He might be imitated, but he cannot be duplicated. And this is the one that dwells within us. This is the one that we serve. So I love what Flo Shaw says. We have our own AI. Our AI versus the world's AI. And what is that? Apostolic influence. That God is going to cause people to be ahead. This is the will of God for us. And this, this for us in this hour, God wants to trust us with this level of revelation and this level of wisdom. Now notice, the Bible says that knowledge puffs up, but charity edifies. We're getting ready to close this broadcast in just a minute here. But I'm leading towards this. Paul said, because of the abundance of revelation, there was nobody in his class. When he, when he came to the level that he was on as a global apostle, and he even talked about his global apostleship multiple times, but especially in Romans 1, you can read it, about him going to all nations and having an apostleship and grace for all nations. He told the Corinthian church, a thorn had to be given to me to keep me humble. What that means is, is that, if we do not have certain amount of humility and if we don't have a certain amount of suffering and if we don't have a certain amount of brokenness and surrender before God, that sense of weakness, that God's strength is perfected in our weakness, that his grace is sufficient for us, we may not be able to handle the level of impartation of wisdom and authority that God is ready to give. I told you coming into this season, that the Lord said, I am not purposely holding back my promises. I am measuring the maturity of my people. And based on how much maturity you have is how much I will release to you. It's the will of God for my son to drive, but he's 12, not today. He's not old enough. He's not mature enough to drive. Do I want him to be old enough? Do I want him to, to be mature enough? Of course. But do I trust him to drive the car? Oh, I'm still taking him to school. So God is saying the same thing to us. I'm not giving you the keys yet to everything you're asking for. I'm watching to see how mature that you are. So this year is a year in which God is going to release things and then see how we respond. He's going to release more wealth and see how we respond. More influence, see how we respond. More gifts, how we respond. More flow and anointing, how we respond. More influence in our communities, more people coming to our churches, how do we respond? He wants us to know how to abound, just as we've learned how to be abased. But our maturity is measured, not just in abasement, but it's also measured in our abounding. 
So as we close our broadcast today, I want to pray this prayer that we can all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of, of, a son, of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we be no more children tossed to and fro. This is the will of God. Father, we pray today in Jesus' name that as you are watching us, as you are releasing to us, it is because there's so much more you want to give. God, let not just a little bit of blessing be enough to sidetrack us in pride or arrogance or better than thou thinking. Let not just a little bit of growth or a little bit of wealth or a little bit of influence because it's more than what we've had before or ever had before. Let it not, oh God, sabotage us where we go to meddling into other things that are of the flesh and not of the spirit. Where we seeking after power or influence or things that are outside the scope of your, of your kingdom. But instead, Father, I pray that you would help us, Lord Jesus, to know how to hold lightly to the things that you put into our hands and understand their purpose. Purify our motives and our hearts before you today. Help us to grow up into you in all things. Help us to be truly mature, that we can handle the global level of harvest and outpouring that you are wanting to give your church that we can handle the amount of revelation, that we can literally know the hidden wisdom. And as Ephesians 3 says, that we will declare through the church the manifold wisdom of God and the principalities and powers will learn from the church. You want us to be first in line. You want us to be there in the throne room before Haman ever comes. You want us to influence that king as Esther did. Oh God, before Haman ever comes so that we are in charge of the plans and the future and not the plans and strategies of hell being the default. We thank you for hearing this prayer today in Jesus' name. Well, I pray this broadcast has helped you today. I pray that Prayer Nation continues to be encouragement to you. If this has blessed you, you may want to share it with someone. If you're on YouTube, make sure you uh, subscribe and uh, do all the things so that you'll be notified. Uh, we want everyone that you feel that that you would sense with it's in your circles that has the same kind of hunger that this resonates with you. It may resonate with them. Share it with them if this is something that has blessed you today. We love you. God bless you. Thank you so much for being a part of Prayer Nation. We look forward to serving you again in this capacity next week, the Lord willing. Thank you.